Hey everyone, Brian Lagunas here, and today I'm going to answer another tech question. If you have a tech question that you'd like to have answered, make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and leave a comment below with your question, and I may just answer it in my next video. Today's question comes from Tamar Ali. He asks, Brian, what is a value task? What's the difference between a task and a value task? And when should I use a value task? Well, these are all great questions. The value task is a little bit confusing and hopefully I can clear this up in this video today. Now, it's important to understand that the value task was added to .NET for a very specific scenario of when your method can return a value synchronously or asynchronously. Now, I know I may have just confused you there. Like, well, Brian, what are you talking about a method that can return synchronously or asynchronously? Well, let's take a look at this example. Now, in this example, we have a method called get data async and it returns a task of t, that t being an int. Now, there are two sections to this code block. The first being a synchronous code block. It's synchronous because what we are doing is we are looking in memory. We're, we're, we're trying to see if there's some type of data in memory that we can already access, that's already available, that we can access and return. So in this example, we're saying, hey, uh, there's something called data cache. It's in memory. And we're checking if the data exists. If it does, then we're going to return that data immediately. This is the synchronous portion. Nothing async is happening here. This is also referred to as a hot path. It's referred to as a hot path because this is the path the code will most likely take because the chances of code being in memory already are very high. Now, in the case where there is no data in memory already, there is no cache, then we hit the second portion of this code block, and that's going to be the asynchronous version. This is where we're actually, you know, calling that asynchronous uh, code to hit some type of service, some type of network call or whatever, and we're getting that data back asynchronously. We're awaiting the task, we get the data, we set the cache, and then we return the data we just got from, from the service. So this portion of the code now returns async. Now this is an example of a method that can be either synchronous or asynchronous. And this is the exact reason that the value task object was created. So how does a value task help us in this scenario? Well, when you have a method that returns a task, it will always instantiate a new task object and return it to the caller. And it doesn't matter what path that code takes, it will always return a task object. So if we look in this example, if we go through the synchronous portion of our code, no matter what, it's going to return a task. So it's going to instantiate that task object, put it on the heap and return it to the caller. But we didn't do any asynchronous code here, right? Doesn't matter. It's going to return a task object. Now, same thing for the asynchronous portion of this code. We actually made an asynchronous call to some service, and therefore it will instantiate a task, add it to the heap, and then it will return it to the caller. So no matter what path your code takes when you're working with a task, it will always instantiate and return a task. Now, how does this differ from using the value task? This is where the value task really shines. Now, a value task is actually a struct and it could be either your T, your value, or a task. It can't be both, it's one or the other. So in this scenario, we change our get data async method to return value task. So what's going to happen is if the code takes the synchronous code block, right, the hot path, it's going to return T, which is in this case, the integer, okay? It's not going to return a task, so there's no need to allocate memory to return a task. It's going to, it's going to return the value directly. Only when it hits the asynchronous portion of the code will it actually uh, instantiate a task object and return that to the caller. When you have code like this or a method like this that is being called, you know, hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, hundred thousands, millions of times, you can see how this can greatly improve the performance of your applications. And this is how the new, uh, you know, system file, reading files uh, code works in .NET. So to get a better understanding, let's look at a demo uh, that benchmarks actually how much performance and how much memory we're saving by using value task in a scenario like this. The sample I'm working with here is a simple console application. And in this application, I've created a service called GitHub service. 
Uh, this service simply has a, uh, a single method called get repos async task, which returns a task, which is a list of repos. And all this is doing is taking in a username. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to check our cache. And we're going to see if there's any repos that match the username stored in cache. If there is, we're going to return those repos. So this means this is our hot path, right? Uh, if it's not, we're going to reach out to GitHub via their API and we get all the repos uh, for the user. And then we're going to set our cache and return the repos. Now, I have another class in here that's going to run a uh, number of benchmark tests. And I'm using benchmark.net to run these, these benchmarks. And as you can see, we've attached a memory diagnoser. And this is going to tell us how quickly something finishes and how much memory it takes. As you can see, we have one benchmark called run task. We have three names and we're gonna loop through a uh, hundred thousand times for each name. And we're gonna call the get repos async task. So let's go ahead. We're going to uh, run this without debugging in release mode. So it, it works how we would expect. And here's the results you can see. Uh, we have our method called run task. It took about 46 milliseconds and allocated uh, 41.2 uh, megabytes. Okay, so now what we want to do is what happens if we want to use a, uh, a value task instead? Because we have that situation where we have a method that can return synchronously or asynchronously. So what I'm going to do is just to make this easier, uh, I'm just going to copy this. We'll call it uh, value task. I'm going to change that to value task. And we're not going to change anything else, right? So we still have our synchronous and asynchronous results. We just renamed our method to get repos async value task, and we changed the return type to uh, value task. Now let's go to our benchmark here. Now I'm going to copy this benchmark. I'm going to create another benchmark. And we're going to call our get async value task. Oh, I guess we should rename that. Let's do a quick build. Go ahead and run our benchmarks again. And let's see what our result is. Now, as you can see, the first method, run task, completed in 76.64 milliseconds and it allocated 41.2 megabytes. Now, with our run value task, so by simply just changing the return type from task to value task, uh, it's a little faster at 72.71 milliseconds. And look at how much memory that has been allocated uh, that we've saved. 50%, right? So we're down to 20.6 megabytes that has been uh, allocated in memory. So as you can see, in this scenario where we have a high throughput application that is calling our method multiple, 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 multiple times very quickly uh, and return synchronously or asynchronously, depending on the state of our cache, the value task really helps us in performance. It saves memory and it executes faster. Now, there are some limitations to using the value task that you should be aware of. First of all, you cannot await a value task multiple times. This is because the underlying object may have been recycled already and it's being used by another operation. So if you see code like this where you're storing off the value task method and you try to wait it multiple times, that's a problem. Don't do that. That's very bad. Uh, the nurse, another scenario is you cannot run them concurrently. So if you are trying to run the value task method concurrently, that is by definition, trying to run them multiple times, which is also a bad thing. Uh, and lastly, you know, don't call get a waiter on the value task method directly uh, to get the result because you, you don't know when the code uh, has been is, has been completed, when that method is done. Right. And so this is very bad. So in general, anytime you are storing off the value task method into a variable, that's setting you up for some very uh, bad things. Now, there are some APIs off of the value task method that you could use to kind of protect yourself, uh, such as the is completed, so you can check to see if the value task has been completed before uh, doing anything. But for the most part, you want to just run your value task directly every single time. Don't store them off and try to run them multiple times. Hopefully I was able to help you better understand the difference between a task and a value task and kind of how they work. And, and really to summarize this entire video, uh, a task is essentially a struct that can return either a, uh, a value or a task and is specifically meant to be used with methods that can return synchronously or asynchronously. And if you were to ask me, Brian, when should I use uh, the value task? Well, first, I would say 99% of the time you're not going to, uh, but if you really want to, 
Just benchmark your code and verify that you would benefit from any type of memory or performance improvement from using the value task. Otherwise, just, just stick with the normal task and you'll be good. If you haven't already, right now is a great time to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Uh, leave a comment below with any questions that you may have that maybe I need to clarify. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.